Howdy folks, it's me, Josh. During the Revolutionary War, the one nation whose ties with the US was most important to them was France. And after the victory in the Battle of Saratoga, Benjamin Franklin, the US Minister to France, managed to convince the French government to join the war against Britain on behalf of the young United States. And after a few years, not without a great amount of support from France, the US would win the war, gaining its independence from Britain. France, though, would only end up getting a bunch of debt, which would end up worsening their financial crisis. In 1785, Benjamin Franklin, who was 80 years old at this point, decided to retire from his post, being replaced by Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson was a Virginia plantation owner who had been greatly influenced by the ideas and thinkers of the Enlightenment. He heavily favored a limited, decentralized government, individual freedoms and rights, and agrarian society as opposed to urban elitism. And even during his time in Paris, he held firm to these beliefs. Then, four years later, fueled by the same Enlightenment principles that had influenced Jefferson, the French Revolution broke out, seeking to overthrow the traditional absolute monarchy in France. Although he wasn't fond of the violence, Jefferson greatly supported the French Revolution as he began to meet with prominent Republicans, helping to draft the Declaration of the Rights of Man. A few months later, in September of 1789, Jefferson returned home to the United States during what he hoped to be a quick visit before returning to France to help with the establishment of a republic. However, this plan would be upended when, shortly after returning, Jefferson ended up being appointed as Secretary of State under the new Washington administration. Though upset about not being able to return to France, Jefferson used his post to continue U.S. support for the French Revolution. Meanwhile, the U.S. was beginning to divide into two major factions. The Federalists, primarily led by John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, with support from Washington as well, supported a strong centralized government and urbanism. And the Democratic Republicans, led by Jefferson and James Madison, supported a decentralized government and agrarianism. And, in 1793, after the execution of Louis XVI and the invasion by France of its neighbors, debates began to arise between the two factions in the U.S. over how to respond. Although both sides agreed that the U.S. needed to stay neutral, the Federalists decried the French Revolution and argued that the revolution nullified the American alliance with France as the regime it was made with was overthrown, and that the U.S. should issue an official proclamation of neutrality and making known its stance against the war. The Democratic Republicans, meanwhile, supported the revolution and argued that the alliance was still intact despite the change in government, and that a proclamation of neutrality was a betrayal of France and also a dangerous expansion of presidential power. Regardless of Jefferson and his faction's arguments, Washington would end up issuing the proclamation, declaring the U.S. officially neutral. Meanwhile, as the war raged on, France would end up coming under what was known as the Reign of Terror as the country came under the control of Maximilien Robespierre, who executed perceived enemies of the revolution en masse. However, this would end up backfiring when Robespierre would be executed himself by his own national convention with the country coming under the control of the moderate Thermidorians. The Thermidorians created a new government known as the Directory, which was plagued with corruption and its ineffectiveness to solve the country's woes would ultimately lead to dissatisfaction as a popular general began to offer a solution, staging a coup taking complete control over France. As this was going on, the U.S. found itself in a heated battle between the Democratic Republicans and the Federalists, which ultimately culminated in the election of 1800, with Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans taking control of the United States. And, though he wouldn't be a direct part of it, Jefferson would continue to look on at what would happen in France and all of Europe. But, what if that changed? What if, in an alternate timeline, Jefferson wasn't appointed as Secretary of State and instead returned to France as he intended? As Jefferson returns to France, the Federalists, seeing an opportunity, begin to take hold over the country in Jefferson's absence. And, without his voice, the Federalists take a much harsher stance against the French Revolution, decrying not just its violence, but its philosophy as a whole, much to the anger of Jefferson. 
As a few years pass, Jefferson continues to support republicanism in France against the wishes of the U.S. government. But by the time Louis XVI is executed, Federalists back home are fed up, partly blaming Jefferson for fanning the flames of the revolution to this level of violence. The Federalists are quick to issue a denunciation of this execution and the revolution as a whole, but Jefferson dissents, continuing his support for his Republican ideal on behalf of the U.S. government. The Federalists are furious and, in response, begin to draft legislation similar to the Sedition and Logan Acts of our timeline directly targeting Jefferson, and that, if he were to continue his actions in France, he would be arrested for treason. The punishment? Death. A year has passed since Louis' execution, and Jefferson, seeing the U.S. as having fallen from what he had hoped it to become and what might await him if he were to return, makes the decision to renounce his citizenship, becoming a full French citizen, hoping to mold France into the image he had hoped for the United States, an enlightened, egalitarian republic. Jefferson gets involved with the Thermidorians, quickly becoming a prominent figure in the new French government, as many in France see him as a true revolutionary who had been forced out of his own country for his revolutionary ideals. He quickly becomes a popular figure throughout France, as many desire his leadership in the French government. During the drafting of the new French constitution, Jefferson becomes a leading voice in how the new government should be formed. He blames the violence of the terror on large, centralized government, instead having France take a decentralized form of governance with focus on the farming peasantry. And, due to Jefferson's leadership and pushes to bolster French agriculture, the food crisis seen in France is, to a degree, mitigated, making Jefferson even more popular among the people. As time goes on, Jefferson becomes even more influential with the national government coming under his effective control. But, as the Thermidorians show themselves to become increasingly corrupt, Jefferson, seeing them as the urban elitists he so despised, began to take action against them as he pulls power away from the corrupt Thermidorians and towards the farming peasantry, making Jefferson even more popular among them. However, with Jefferson making an enemy of both the corrupt Thermidorians and the radical Jacobins, enemies begin to conspire against him. A revolt breaks out, but Jefferson sends famed general Napoleon Bonaparte to crush the uprising against him. And so, with the uprising crushed, Jefferson solidifies his control over France as a new consulate is formed, with Jefferson taking the role of first consul over all of France, with Bonaparte by his side. Meanwhile, as the war rages on, Napoleon continues to dominate the battlefield as France grows in its dominance over all of Europe. And the United States, under firm Federalist control, grows ever closer with Britain. But France, once again seeking to restore its colonial empire, purchases the Louisiana Territory from Spain, but this time is very unwilling to sell the territory to the hostile United States. The U.S. is angered with Jefferson's purchase of the territory, hoping to gain it for themselves as many begin calling for war with France. But many others still say the U.S. is unprepared for war. In the end, the U.S. doesn't go to war, but this doesn't stop American resentment towards France. As time goes on, France continues to dominate the European continent as Napoleon wins battle after battle with Jeffersonian republicanism spreading throughout all the territories they conquered. However, France is still defeated in the end as Europe begins to turn on them. As the coalition forces close in on France, the U.S. sees its opportunity, joining the coalition and seizing the Louisiana Territory. But, with Napoleon defeated, Jefferson is deposed as the monarchy is once again restored, with Napoleon being taken prisoner and Jefferson being sent to the United States to be executed for treason. In the end, Europe, despite Jefferson's removal, begins to see a rise in his ideas of agrarian republicanism as the United States follows down a very different Federalist route. But Jefferson is once again solidified in his place in history, being remembered as the culmination of the French Revolution and its greatest leader. This video was made in collaboration with Videntis, who covered the flip side of this scenario. Hi, I'm Videntis. Over on my channel, I explore the opposite scenario, where Napoleon escaped the British after Waterloo and managed to get to the US. Once in America, he entered politics, teamed up with Andrew Jackson, 
invaded Canada, and eventually became the president. So, if you like the idea, go over to my channel, Videntis, to see what would happen. I hope to see you there. So, if you enjoyed today's video, make sure to check his out. But, if you want to see more content just like this, make sure to stick around for more. And hey, you could also, maybe, subscribe or something. So, that's it for today's video. Well, till next time, see ya.